days were you guys wrestling fans? Uh, well, you, you, you left you left a couple guys out actually, by the way. Uh, Tom Zink. I know that's on tonight's list. <laughs> the Z Man. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> hey, but see, they're special because they got up. They came out here early today at ten thirty. So we're going to give them some things that the guys tonight aren't getting. So Brady Boone. <laughs> so to answer the question, yeah. Ken. To answer the question, though. Um, not no, not really. I mean, we were focused on uh, the the list you gave off. The majority of us on football. We, you know, we played the same high school football team together, and uh, of course, we knew Kurt's dad, Larry the Axe sure. Henning, uh, which I'm sure you're oh, familiar yeah. with. Absolutely, I'm guessing AWA, yep, legendary absolutely. Ken Resnick, AWA. By the way, just so you know, <laughs> in case you're not sure who this guy is, a and WWF. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, you cut cut your teeth though. Yes, in, good, in, absolutely. In the AWA, that's where you that's where you learned all your trade, perfected it in the WWF. It, How about that? It, absolutely. In fact, we talked about it last night at the Marty party, <clears throat> and you can relate to this. They wanted me. Marty said, "Okay, can you come up with a trivia question? And we, you were, we were going to give this and this away." So I'm thinking and thinking and thinking, and this is the absolute truth. Of all the thousands of interviews. I've done in the different promotions. Okay. There was only one interview that I was absolutely intimidated. And somebody guessed it pretty quick because I had not had a chance to meet them. They had been out of the country. They came in and it was like, you know, got ready and boom, do, your, do an interview with them. For, the first interview I ever did with Animal and Hawk. I was like, I hadn't had a chance to meet them. They yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they you know, were pretty intimidating, just so oh, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even in the ring. Yeah. I'm just but saying. That, that was, you know, everybody else I generally knew ahead of time yeah. or, you know, say so you got anything special. I had no prep other than, and here comes, you know, Animal and Hawk and Paul, and I'm going like, oh, shit. <laughs> But they were great guys. Yeah, they were. Well, and, and uh, a lot of history there with uh, myself yep. and, and Animal and Hawk. And, you know, the other list you, you, you listed off there, and, and the question really to, to finalize that question as far as, like, do we entertain the idea of ever getting into I don't even know that Kurt did. Like, Kurt really didn't. Again, we knew his dad. You know, I knew he was up in the stands for the, for the football sure. games and stuff. But we didn't talk about it. We didn't really. So to later on, all of these guys end up in that profession is kind of amazing in and, a sense. And, you know, it's a really good point, Nikita. Back in those days, you know, especially Minnesota, other than Greg Gagne, who was in a difficult spot, his dad having mm -hmm. the territory, second-generation guys weren't as prevalent then as they are now. Yeah, more, more, yes. I mean, of course, obviously there's a connection and a door to, you know, an open door of opportunity sure. most likely. But, but even go, going back to Kurt, I mean, so we played high school football together. We ended up playing college football against each other. So he had, I think, more of an interest in pursuing football than he did wrestling. But he got injured in college, blew out his knee in college. In fact, during the state championship game, uh, uh, he was on one sideline on crutches. I was actually on the other sideline on crutches. We didn't even get to play against each other in that championship game, uh, but we were opposing each other. And because of that injury, I think that's why he ended up then pursuing wrestling. Oh, okay. You know, and then we're going to throw it open because I know you guys are here way more to hear from Nikita than me. But you brought something up, and part of it I'm sure a lot of you know, but I'm going to ask kind of a different question. I know that you played college football with Joe Laurinaitis, and it was Joe, as I understand. If I'm wrong, let me know. It was kind of Joe that talked you out of, pro football aspirations and got you into wrestling. So the short version of that story is, yeah, not so much talked me out of it as much as just uh, uh, made the phone call to open the door of opportunity. So just a little quick backstory for those who maybe aren't familiar with this. So I, I actually literally recruited Joe out of high school, New Brighton, uh, sure. Irondale High School, New Brighton, Minnesota, which you're probably familiar sure. with, New Brighton, Minnesota. Just say, but uh, <laughs> recruited him into college football. We played a couple of years together. He ended up dropping out of college. I went on to, to play and, and be scouted by the NFL and pursuing that path. 
graduating, training for a pro football tryout. And next thing I know, he's on this, this, this TV called TBS, something like that, <laughs> Channel 17, Superstation, 605, I think. And, and so, and then he would later call me, make the phone call to share the storyline of a nephew for, for <laughs> Uncle Laiban. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then open that door of opportunity for me. So that's kind of the shorter version. Of okay, now work. here's my question that I, I research and you're talking to people I've never heard. At that point, how serious were you about pursuing pro football when he lured you in or that, that's where he I'm made the call? Going. Yeah, no, it's a great question because I was, so I graduated college and, and again, a little bit more backstory. So, you know, there's a couple injuries. I, and the reason I was on the sideline, uh, and the reason I was on one sideline in the championship game and Kurt was on the other is because he blew out his knee. But what I didn't tell you is I had fractured my leg. If you're familiar with the Lawrence Taylor, Joe Theismann fracture, uh, in, in, in a game my freshman year, I fractured my tibia, fibula, broken half, pre Theismann. So <laughs> when Theismann fractured his, I knew exactly what he went. What I didn't tell you too was my senior year, uh, interestingly enough, uh, scouted by the NFL, but fractured my other leg oh. in a game my senior year, headed into the national playoffs for our, our particular team and in, in, in division. And so I was rehabilitating for a year and a half, uh, literally spending about eight hours a day in a gym, training for that pro football tryout. So to, to answer you, very serious. Because that was my dream as a kid. My dream was to play pro football one day. I had my whole life figured out at age 12. Anybody else uh, identify with that? <laughs> I had it all figured out at age 12. And, and, and how'd that work out for you? <laughs> well, uh, it, you know what? It, it, there, was a few, there was a few. I, I like to say this. You know, we, we all, we've all had setbacks, right? And so fractured legs certainly are a setback. But fortunately for me, uh, and as encouragement to all of you, a setback doesn't have to hold you back. It can. But a setback can really be a setup for a comeback. And so this little nugget for you has nothing to do with wrestling. So anyone who needs to be inspired, you know, whatever setback you may experience in life, just use that as a setup for a comeback and then be determined to come back, which I was. And so I trained, man, I was training for that, that pro football trial when I got that phone call. And, and of course, the rest is history. <laughs> history. But yeah. And, and I feel safe in saying, I think it worked out pretty well. Well, you asked how it worked out for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got a room full of people here. Thank you all for coming, by the way. You guys are amazing. You really are. And so, yeah, I, 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 I think it worked out okay. Okay, I'm sure you've got a ton of questions. You're probably sitting there, when is Ken going to shut up? So let's open it up. Who's well, first? I was wondering that, Ken, myself. <laughs> You've been wondering that forever. I'm I know. kidding. I'm kidding. Yes, sir. R rumor and how much was true? So the, the, the question for those maybe in the back who couldn't hear, he said, you know, he heard, heard rumors in the 80s about me jumping from NWA to WWF and uh, was how much was true, how much was rumors. And so um, it, it was all rumors. And of course, the magazines, I just saw uh, the legendary Bill Apter upstairs on my way in, who is, uh, gets much, much credit uh, along with many other guys for my success in professional wrestling with all of the magazine exposure. And so it's probably more propagated by the magazines and, and, and others talking about, you know, the what ifs. What, what if Nikita Koloff wrestled Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania? And, and so um, I, I never had a conversation. I met Vince one time in a gym in Las Vegas when we were going head to head. You know, his, he was at one building that night. We were at another building, had a cordial conversation, um, had no other conversations beyond that. If they left a message on my recorder, some of you look old enough to remember when you had a landline and, uh, and an actual recorder with the light blinking, like, oh, I got a message. Let me go see what it is. So uh, I must have missed the, the voicemail if they left me one. But, and, and let me just say this, too. Never really honestly entertained the idea uh, of jumping uh, from one to the other. Jim Crockett Jr. gave me my break in professional, an un unbelievable break. And so to this day, I feel uh, lo loyal to the NWA, lo you know, forever loyal to the NWA, and have no regrets in looking back and not making the jump. 
The only other conversation I might have had regarding that was with Barry Darso when he was Crusher Cruise chef. Anyone remember him as Crusher Cruise sure. before he went to be demolition? He did, he did let me know he was leaving and going there to form this demolition team and, and was I interested in, in joining him. And, and truthfully, I thought I'd worked on my character so hard uh, uh, to get it over that I really wasn't interested in going and taking on a new persona. And so because of my loyalty to the NWA and out of respect to the Legion of Doom Road Warriors, uh, I made a decision to stay and continue my career in the NWA. Great you, question. You Thank know, you. And, and I will tell you, <clears throat> having you know, worked for Vern, Vince, uh, AW, I have a number of promotions. I always admired that because back in the day, for 98% of the boys, you know, you want me? How much more are you going to pay me? Okay, you got me. And, and that loyalty back, even back then, mm -hmm. was rare. And I, I really always admired that because... You were there, and that was it. And, and, I, and I appreciate that, Ken. Let me just say for all of you, too, to, really to, kind of to that point, you know, you look back and you go, I, I mean, I, I, I probably could have, would have, it's all somewhat speculation, right, but made ten times the money had I made the jump. You know, probably would have got a pretty decent payday as a main eventer against Hulk Hogan in WrestleMania, most likely. Yeah, go out on a limb there. I'm going to go out on a limb there, you know. <laughs> Might have made a pretty good payday. Um, but looking back and, and even considering the, the, the money and the, what, I, what I passed up, um, if you get any, spend any time with me, get to know me, you're going to find out I'm probably loyal to a fault. And, and loyal, loyalty is very big with me. And so I was willing to pass up the, the box. So I appreciate what you're saying. I, uh, there's a number of ways I'm, I've been thrown, I guess, into a rare category, and that's one of them, just staying loyal to the, to the NWA. Now, let, let me add one last thing, because I did some things at the AWA, yep. and people say, yeah, but you were, but uh, most of that was co-promotion stuff. For those of you who remember when, when Crockett and Vern were doing things together, like the, the metal. Pro game. Wrestling USA. Pro Wrestling USA. And so, so I really had Jim's blessing to go up and do some television and do some, world championship matches against the legend himself, Larry Zabisco. And so that was really with Jim's blessing. That was, wasn't me signing a contract with the NWA. That was just me coming in as an independent contractor to help Vern out. So, but overall, NWA loyal through and through. So. Well, I, I really appreciate that because I was doing AWA and Pro Wrestling USA. Yeah. And I noticed right after yeah. I left those two and went to Vince, you popped up. So I'm glad to know it didn't have, you were just waiting for me to I leave. I was waiting for you to leave, <laughs> Ken. That's it. That was the only thing I needed. So, <laughs> yes. To discern what Dusty was saying and what I was saying? Is that what your son was saying? Can, can somebody interpret for me? Is that what he was saying? Yeah. Dusty was legendary at throwing some, 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 cutting some promos. Question. So the, the question for those who, the others who maybe can't hear is, you know, what, what, what at, at events like this, what have, what, have, what have people brought that maybe is unique? Or so, I mean, there's been so many different unique things that people have brought to these signings and, and these gatherings, uh, if you will, that have, uh, I, none in particular just jump out other than to say there's been a, a lot of unique things that have been brought uh, for, for me to sign, and, uh, and so I, I just marvel, uh, honestly, in all sincerity, marvel at all, all of you, one, in your loyalty to, to, and I've said over and over and over and over again, 
You guys are the best on the planet. Of all the sports on the planet, you guys are the most loyal, I feel anyway. That's just my, my observation. Um, so lo lots, of, lots of different things that, that people have brought. I can't really name any one thing in particular. And uh, to be curious, I'll be curious to see who, what they bring today, so later this afternoon. So, yes, sir, you had your hand up over there. Stark 86 against Flair. So the interesting thing is, and I guess Magnum and I are doing a photo op here uh, together in just a little while. Um, but the, the interesting thing, when I look back at that uh, and Magnum's accident, which they, they, it took him a, a few minutes to convince me uh, because everybody realized wrestling is like a work now, right? Anyone in here not? Uh, just checking to see if anyone... But, but, you know, in those days, we, we were portraying something up. But, so knowing wrestling was at work, so when I came back from Japan and they told me Magnum had the accident, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, uh-huh. You know, so they finally convinced me of that. Uh, and then they said, we have another idea, uh, and that was to, t to team up with, with Dusty and Flip from, from one of the most hated at the time uh, to become uh, ultimately a, a fan favorite, uh, was... Uh, um, if Magnum had never had the wreck, I don't know that I ever would have flipped. I, I may have stayed healed my whole entire career. I, I, again, somewhat speculation, so don't, don't really know, right, for sure. Uh, but because of the accident, you know, I made the change and then was thrown into that Starrcade 86 match. That wouldn't have been the original plan because if I stayed healed, the, Magnum was just days away from from literally fly in New York to sign a contract to become the next world heavyweight champion. And I envision, had, had he done that and got the strap, that he and I would have had many other, maybe a best of seven for the world heavyweight title. Flag versus flag, all kinds of, of, of other uh, matches that he and I, was, we would, Mag and I would have had a long career together, uh, I feel, and uh, so it just was natural for th to thrust me into that match at Starrcade 86 against Flair. So To follow up on a couple of points you, you, you made, Nikita, I mean, <clears throat> back in those days, it was kind of pre, you know, there was no internet, there was no real superstation, so whatever you did in one city, fans 200 miles away may have had no idea. Right. <clears throat> but how... I, I mean, obviously, it was a huge testament to your abilities and Magnum's abilities. But how unusual was it for them to come right out and say, we're booking you guys in a best of seven series. And yeah, I remember, like, in WWF days, the agents, especially on house shows, guys would come in and say, well, what do you want us to do? And I'd do the same thing you did last night. Mm -hmm. Well, so how unusual was that where you guys knew basically every match had to be different? Right. Well, to, to, to Terry, to Magnum's credit, um, you know, he had had at the time much more experience than me <laughs> in professional wrestling. Uh, and and uh, although a very similar introduction to professional wrestling, I learned from uh, a session he and I did together. And, uh, and so much, much more thought went into to, to that question, much more thought went into uh, making sure each match was unique in and of itself that would just draw, you know, the fans into the storyline, you know, and, and then the way we did it, which that was Dusty's brainchild, you know, was the best of seven. He gets all the credit for the idea on the best of seven. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was pretty... Uh, Challenging, but at the same time, exciting to be able to, to bring that to the fan and make each match look unique and different. So, another question. Good English tutoring, you know. Doesn't need sub. So he you're said saying I talk, I talk really good. He's you're, you're saying he doesn't need <laughs> subtitles today. <laughs> no subtitles, right? <laughs> He, he, he said, can you cut a promo in the accent? The, the answer is yes. The question is, how much do you have in order to receive that, that promo? Because uh, here's what's interesting, Ken. Here's what's interesting for all of you. So I, as some of you perhaps are aware, for, 
for 12 years. Now, if you do the math on this, I was only, I broke in in June of 84. I officially departed November of 1992. That was my last match. But I carried the persona for three more years post-retirement. 24-7, so please understand, anywhere, anywhere in public, restaurants, movie theaters, airplanes, airports, wherever, my gym, I had a gym back then. I spent eight to 10 hours a day in a gym training people on how to work out, how to eat, with the accent. <laughs> like for real. I, like, like, and and I, I told you we were, we were gonna talk about that. I mean, you know, back in, in the kayfabe days, if there was you know, a lot of public around, I mean, and you know, two of the sweetest guys in the world were Nick Bockwinkel and Bobby Heenan. Uh, 180 degrees from, you know, their... What you their saw on TV, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, 180 degrees. But, you know, they would carry it to a point, but I don't think anyone, like you said, carried it out to the degree hmm. and 24-7. And I, I guess I've always wondered, meaning this as a compliment, because nobody did it, but what prompted you... Hmm. To, to do, do that. And also, how hard was that for you? Well, so, and, and to kind of tag on to what I, <laughs> your, your, really your question is, it, it, so it, it was hard in, 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 a, in several ways. One, mentally had to ascend there. Now, I didn't know I was doing this at the time. I later learned that, that uh, you know, when you project your, yourself into a certain role, uh, I, Mentally, I thought, you know, to get this character over, this is what... Crockett didn't ask me to do it. I just did it. I mean, I went and got, found a Russian workbook. I found... Anyone know what a cassette tape is? Anyone know what that is? <laughs> um, found one of those, a Russian cassette tape, was listening to the language, figuring out how some phrases, put a, some phrases together. De so it took about six months to develop. Uh, you know, cause, and, and spoke no, no English uh, for a long time, uh, not, a, not just on television, but again, anywhere in public, right? Ivan did all my talking. We go to a restaurant, he did all my ordering. Like, I just point, like, to something. I mean, when I got an apartment in Charlotte, Ivan co-signed. When we went to the uh, phone company and the electric company, and everywhere, he co-signed. He goes, yeah, it's my nephew, doesn't speak any English, you know. <laughs> Like for real, like for real, right? He co-signed everything. Hey, I ordered a magazine, a propaganda magazine back in those days called Pravda. It was a Russian magazine in English. I thought, hey, the male guy's going to deliver this. He's going to go, wow, he really is Russian. You know, I, I legally changed my name because I figured somebody, I'm going to get stopped, maybe for speeding. I don't no. know. No. Maybe. maybe. Uh, you know, and, and so, and so my, my driver's license, passport. My, I was reminded of this not long ago. My first child, okay, I raised two that were not my own, as, as my own, and then my first child, Kendra, who had just recently visited, had her second child, my 10th grandchild. She was born across the street here at the University Hospital, okay? On the birth certificate, I kid you not, it says, Father's Birthplace, Lithuania, <laughs> on her... For real. I'm like, how do I get that changed? Can I? I'm like, oh my gosh, I was crazy, right? Lithuania on her birth certificate, it says, right? So, so it was really hard to phase it out, which is why I did it, phase out the accent. And it was really hard on my vocal cords, like for real. So people ask me that all the time. Hey, give me the voice. I'm like, not as easy as it once was. That's why I require you to pay for it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but every now and then, I can throw a couple words and whatnot. But anyway, we're going to move on, take some more questions before uh, we run out of time you, here. You know what? To, to follow up, because you carried it <clears throat> to, you know, legendary extreme. How hard is it, or how do you feel about watching today's 
product where basically kayfabe is dead. Yeah, you could. I don't know that. You, I don't think. Let me ask you. Could could somebody do what I did in today's world? Probably not, right? I mean, between social media, internet, all that kind. Of, yeah, there was no there was no one in it. Nobody could research to find out I was from. In fact, I'll tell you one one last quick story on that. We I, I want to get as many questions as we can today. Um, I worked out at a gym in Charlotte called Gold Gym. The first day I walked in there, they, they, paid, me, they paid for a month for me, 25 bucks. I got to know the manager, Roger. Worked out over five months, uh, signals with him. Because like, I would walk in, work out, walk out, not say a word to anyone. And just do my own thing. And worked out some signals for him to like help lift and all this. Well, Pete, the owner, I didn't know he was the owner. He walked up to me first day. He's like, yeah, he's joking. He's like, you're too big to work out. I'm going to have to double your membership. Ha, ha, ha. And I just growled at him <laughs> and walked away. And, and I could see he's like, who's this jerk? And I see the, the manager run over and go, hey, explain to him. He don't speak no English. I go, oh. 13 months later, now Barry Darcel's in the territory now, 13 months later, he comes to me and he just whispers to me, he goes, Minnesota. It took him 13 months to find out I wasn't really from Russia. <laughs> and I didn't speak a word of English in that gym for 13 months. <laughs> and and anyway, then he goes over to Darcel, he goes, you, and he threw a few colorful exp expletives. He goes, you knew, and Barry's like, what are you talking about, Pete? What are you talking about? Like, Barry's K favor. He's like, I don't know what you mean, Pete. He goes, man, Minnesota. He goes, but here's what he said. I got so much respect for that guy, I will never tell anybody what I know. He goes, not even my wife, right? So, anyway, so I, I just, I, you know, I'm in, again, a rare category, right, of, of because I was taught. Category of one. I was taught to protect the business. That's what I was taught. Old school. Protect the business at, at all costs. That's what I was taught. So, Eddie's in the house. You got your hand up, Eddie. Let's move on. Qu quick question. What did you think of all the war games? The war games. Yeah. yeah uh, great to be a part of, especially the very first one. Because here's what we didn't know. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what to, what to anticipate. Because, again, another brainchild of Dusty Rhodes, right? The legendary man himself. And so we, we, didn't, we didn't know what to expect in the war games. And so that very first one, although many of them were memorable, certainly when we took them on tour and later on when I was a part of Sting Squadron, you know, and we repeated it, but nothing like the very first one, Eddie. Nothing like the very, uh, that night, that building was electric. And uh, here's one thing. I said this on a podcast interview the other day. And uh, by the way, if you do that sort of thing, Please, please go, uh, go to, uh, go, go look up uh, the Man Up Show. Uh, that's uh, that's my podcast. It's on all all the platforms. It's also a TV show as well now, uh, on several networks, uh, uh, streaming networks, and YouTube, Facebook, the Man Up Show. Uh, I'll have some postcards. Uh, you can grab one later. But um, and and so. I was sharing this the other day. Here's one thing we figured out, though. If you remember the war games and how, right, is, is, is flip the coin, right, two guys start, and then every two minutes it alternates. Everyone kind of remember that, okay? And, and I, to this day, I can't figure out how the heels kept winning the coin toss every time. I'm like, <laughs> how's that happen? Well, well, the odds are we should win one. Well, D Dusty was involved in that, right? Well, he was involved so in that. So did you ever think it might have been a two-headed two or two-sided <laughs> tail? It might have been a two-sided <laughs> coin. That's how the heels kept winning. But he was on our side, though. So anyway. And, and what, the he, what the horsemen figured out real quick was, you know, you mentioned Road Warrior Hawk. What the horsemen figured out real quick, we want him in last, not first. <laughs> he was very physical with the horsemen. <laughs> he was jacked up, excited to get in there. And I think he potatoed every one of them when he came in that very first time. You know, we want him last. We don't want him first. We want him in there for two minutes, not 30. I've got an interesting question. That, uh, anyway, I, I, thank you, Eddie never heard asked and having been in the business i've seen a lot of guys do a turn from heel to face okay. or, or face to heel and honestly for a lot of them didn't work out they just couldn't pull it off but you were literally one of the top heels mm. in the company mm. and you were one of the top baby faces I mean, okay. without a doubt thank you sir but which one did you like better? You know, again, this podcast the other day, I was, I was asked, uh, uh, you know, 
that very question, and really, honestly, and, and on social media. Uh, I, somebody posed that recently. I really can enjoy both sides. I'm glad I got to experience both sides, and I can't honestly say I enjoyed one more than the other, but I'm really glad I got to experience both, both sides of, of that. So, yeah. Yep. Another question. Mm. And, you know, you started off your career basically to work with Rui. Uh, what was it like to work with him? What type of guy, you know, did you, and I know it's going to be all wonderful accolades, but, you know, do you have any good stories about him or things that you guys did or something that, you know, so he's asking about, uh, you know, being able to work with Uncle Ivan. And, of course, you know, he gets – him and Don Kernodle get, get so much credit for the success of my career. Uh, again, for those who – and he's asking, do I have any stories about you – because know, we traveled, you know, two-plus years uh, exclusively. I mean, we roomed together, you know, back in those days. Uh, you know, you, you, you split the cost of a hotel room. Many, many of the guys did just to save a, you know, save a few bucks. You may or may not know. You know, there was no contracts back in those days. Our guarantee uh, was $50. That was our guarantee, uh, whether there was 5,000 people in, in the building or five people in the building. We knew we were going to make 50 bucks. And, and we had what was called trans back in those days, meaning a guy used his own car. You'd maybe pile two, three, four guys in your car, and then all the riders had to, however, however many miles it was, I forget how much it was per mile, but however many miles away, if it was a 200-mile trip, you know, each guy uh, co coughed up at the, at the end of the night, coughed up some trans. And it wasn't uncommon on longer trips to make more money on trans than you did in the match that night, like for real. If you're not familiar, some of you are shaking your head, you understand. Um, and, and so, you know, Ivan and I would split rooms together, split costs on that. You know, you, you paid your own, for your own food. I used to pack a cooler, for those who know my story, guys that make fun of me. It's kind of like, who got the last laugh? I retired at 33. Some of them are still wrestling. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> who gets the last laugh? You know, uh, I feel fortunate. I, I was, I think, one of the first guys to hire actually a, a, a legit business manager, a good friend of mine out of high school, Tim Peltier. And, and literally, now here's something you may not know. Literally, I, I, at one point, I, I would, I would, everything was sent to Tim, like, like rent and phone bills and my checks from Crockett. Everything was sent to him, and then he just gave me a, a weekly stipend to spend per week, a budget, if you will. And so I'm very fortunate to have had that. And so uh, getting to know Ivan over the years, legendary uh, him and Don Canoto. What some don't know is, you know, that debut in the ring that night in Raleigh, Dorton Arena, you know, that was my first uh, step into a professional wrestling ring. The instructions were, uh, Ivan, don't let him trip on the ropes or his career's over before it starts. Because I'd never been in a ring. I'm like, how hard can that be? Well, if you've never tried to step into a professional ring, uh, it's harder than you might think it is. You, you know, so, I've been a lot of guys that have broken in, had their first match. <clears throat> and they will come back and say, all the training, everything, doesn't prepare you for that first match in front of the crowd. And I told you I was going to ask this. Mm -hmm. And they always say, I've learned so much in, in, in that eight minutes or ten minutes or whatever. Your match, first match, went 13 seconds. What would you learn? <laughs> Don't trip on the ropes. That's what I learned in that match. Uh, and, uh, and, and, Ken, so, I had, so, I, had, so I, I had no amateur wrestling background, no professional training, which I made sure Jim Crockett knew that before I drove 1,200 miles to a city where I'd never been, Charlotte, North Carolina. And so, so the day I walked into that office, he introduced me to the world champions, Don and Ivan, and I debuted that night. To their credit... I spent the next couple, three months showing up. The three of us rode together, traveled together, get to the town two, three hours early. They'd thump and bump all over the ring, teaching me the mechanics of wrestling. And then every night I'd sit in their corner and watch their world title match. And then every night we'd drive home and discuss the old school psychology of wrestling. And then every night I got the opportunity to go out and, and perfect that. And, and fortunately, I guess you might say, uh, I, I did okay and was a, 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 an early uh, adapter and, and a good student, you might say, teachable and coachable. Because within 13 months, so within 13 months, 
I had then become the world tag champion, the world six man. It was wrestling a guy by the name of Ric Flair for the world heavyweight title at the first ever Great American Bash. And last but not least, what I remember about, about, about Ivan, he had a different lifestyle than I, so it was quite interesting. Uh, he had quite a bit different lifestyle than I. And uh, so just to, to, to watch what he did outside of the ring, uh, just reinforce what I didn't want to do <laughs> in those days. Uh, let me just say it that way, uh, okay, uh, out of respect for Ivan. But, but later he would have a, a, in 1995, he would have a life changing transformation when I invited him, to, knowing his lifestyle, when I invited him to a revival service in Concord, North Carolina. Some of you may or may not know this story. And, I, and he showed up one of the nights. I didn't know he was there until I saw him at the altar. And he had a genuine encounter with Christ that night and was literally, great story. If he was here today, he'd be the first to tell you the story. He was set free of drug addiction that night. Tobacco, he used to love to have a pinch between his cheek and gums, if you will. He was set free of tobacco addiction, alcohol, set free of drug addiction. And, and I don't know another cuss word ever came out of his mouth again from 1995 to the day he passed away. And so uh, we became the best of friends. He was like an uncle to me, like, you know, an uncle that I didn't have. So, all right, you had your hand up here a couple times, so... Yeah. What does that mean? It will be a mystery forever. So he wants to know what that means. I get asked that all the time, and uh, I'll let you. I'll let you all continue to ponder on that. Let me. Let me. Uh, people are like, "How do you even spell that?" I'm like, "I'll let you figure that one out too." So uh, it's just something I developed, uh, but I, 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 I'm not at liberty to say the meaning of it. So. Do you watch a lot of today's product? On TV? Uh, when I walked away from wrestling, um, I, I walked away from wrestling. And, and to this day, so I walked away officially, I think November 7th, 1992 against Van Vader was my final match. And uh, I've never watched an entire show of, of, of any league uh, to this day. I've seen bits and pieces kind of here and there. Um, I, I learn more from the fans than I do from, from the internet and social media about what's going on um, and, and keep abreast of it that way. So. From, from your standpoint, and, and you brought up how Ivan taught you the psychology of yeah. matches back then. Yeah. And Lord knows, I was lucky enough in the AWA to learn that from Bockwinkle and Heenan and Crusher and Mad Dog and Lanza. But from what little you, you see or read, do you kind of lament the fact that the old school psychology almost doesn't exist anymore? It's more high spot, high spot, high spot. I, I mean, I, I, and again, it's kind of like, you know, could, could a guy protect his character like I protected my character back then? And would the, could the business ever go back to that? Well, no. No, because all of you know it's, it really is work. <laughs> Even though I was taught to protect it and, and, and portray that it's real. And, and this is kind of fun. I've had a number of fans that, that would tell me in those, back in those days, they would say, they'd walk out of the building going, well, I don't know about those other matches, but that match against Magnum and Nikita was real, man. That match was real. But, but that was our goal, right? And so to, to know that more or less the majority of matches and interviews and all of that in today's world is, is essentially scripted, which if you do or don't know, in those days we had what, what a friend of mine calls a predetermined outcome. But if I was wrestling Flair for 60 minutes, I might have had a, a two, three minute outcome. But for 56 or seven or eight minutes, he and I would have to many times, most times, uh, improvise and spontaneously tell you a story in the ring on the fly. And, and so uh, I don't know that that would, would ever be repeated. And, and, and it's, it is what it is today. Uh, everyone, you know, it's got its following. Uh, I'd love to, to see it still give guys more liberty, but, but yeah. yeah so. Even 
I, I'm sure with you, but AWA, WWF, even on the interviews, whether it was Piper or Hulk or Savage. All or spontaneous. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say all, to, to like You talking about Savage Dusty or, earlier. Or, or, all spontaneous. Or Piper, say, you got anything special? They go, no, you start, well, I'll follow you. Yep. I, I mean, we didn't rehearse anything. Nothing. I don't know if you guys have realized that. that no, no rehearsing of interviews uh, in, in addition to matches. I mean, many of those towns in those times, we were in separated locker rooms. We weren't even in a locker room together. And we didn't see each other until we got in the ring. And it was a referee carrying the finish from, from, from one dressing room to the other and get in the ring and, man, tell a story. It, uh, hopefully, you might appreciate the business of just even slightly more now, knowing more of that if you didn't know that. But, um, yeah, yeah, every, every, and you look at a Dusty Rhodes interview, man, I mean, he was the, one of the best of the best of the best when it came to cutting a promo. He, everybody know what I'm talking about, right? The, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, Tau power, too sweet to be sour, if you will. Yeah, son of a plumber with teaming up with the, teaming up with Nikita Korov, baby. We don't see eye to eye, if you will, but the son of a plumber. You're great. We're, we're going to create the superpowers here. This you do here. Dusty better than Dusty did. Well, hey, <laughs> I had the good fortune of traveling with him for two years, like exclusively. Him and I in his little red convertible Mercedes. Kind of like, kind of, and, and, and developed a love for the man. So you had a question over here. So the question was, and uh, being, being a world champion, really titles. Now, I, didn't, I never had the, the singles. Well, I had a world television championship, which was a singles technically, I guess. Uh, uh, never took uh, Flair's belt from him, uh, at least legally anyway. Um, <laughs> beat him a, lot, a bunch of times, but, but uh, never put the belt around my waist. But what do I prefer? You know, uh, Brian, Brian's a good friend of mine, Brian and Jamie Johnson, the big supporters of the ministry, by the way, and, and got an amazing business down in Aiken, South Carolina. Um, huh? Come on. Yeah, drive Crescent. Hey, everybody drives a Crescent. It's just saying, come on. So um, it's, the question is, what do I prefer? You know, tag, singles, Six ma you know, I, Brian, I enjoyed them all. Like, now, now as a, in a singles match, there was, you know, there actually more pressure on you to perform because all eyes essentially are on you, right? I mean, you and the other guy. Whereas in a tag match if, or six man or even an eight man, like if you got what we might say lost out there, which occasionally happened, from, especially when you're green like yeah. me, you get lost a few times. So those matches actually can to work to your benefit because you get a lot of you you can let me, let me tag out here man let me let the other guy get in here because i'm i'm law i'm clueless right now right uh whereas a single match was more pressure on you to perform but all that to say i really enjoyed every one of the matches man i really enjoyed them all so yeah now now that answer was a testament to how hard you worked out because most guys would immediately say a tag, why? When I was getting ready to blow up, man, I'd just tag out and go rest. I didn't care what was going on. So when you said you enjoyed them all, you really worked out. <laughs> no, I really did, and I did. I mean, look, Flair and I wrestled 60 minutes many times. Now, I'm going to tell you, 285 pounds, I, I, I'll be the first to tell you, my tongue was dragging at times, like for real. But again, because of the old school psychology, you know, one of the things he always said in a single, Brian, was if you get lost in a singles match, grab a hold. Gra grab a hold. Now, you know, which, which in the modern day wrestling, right, it, it, like you said, high spot, high spot, high spot, high spot, high spot, high spot, right? But in those old days, we were taught to get the most out of the least and give you the opportunity to actually comprehend what it was we were doing in the ring, to draw you into the story, to build the story that would lead into that predetermined outcome. So in that single match, you'd grab a hold, especially if you were green or new. And then you could regather your thoughts and then figure out what you wanted to do next. And so, again, to your point, it was more of a challenge. But, yeah, those 60-minute matches against Flair, man, they were challenging. Let me just say that. Yes, sir. So, to piggyback off of what you just answered, uh, going back to the title thing, you had the U.S. title, you had the TV, and then there was the world, world title. Do you feel like your character would have been able to achieve the level it did as a world champion? 
Okay, great story. Or, a great question. Do you feel like basically uh, if, the, if it had been, you had those, those matches with Flip, okay, you as a world champion now, does that, does that change? Does it change things? So the question for you in the back of the room, um, really essentially what I hear you asking is, would I have been able to carry the World Heavyweight Championship? Would I have been able to carry that? And you may or may not know, back in those days, there was a $25,000 deposit in order to hold that title, kind of a guarantee that you'd actually give it up, <laughs> okay? So there was that. And honestly, people have said, man, they should have put the belt on you at that first American Bash in 1985. They really should have. Everyone kind of anticipated or expected I would. Give. They're like, God, this guy's going to kill Flair, right? Crush this guy. And, and truthfully, looking back, I'll just be real transparent with you, looking back, um, I, I don't know that I would have been able, because I was only 13 months in the business, I don't know that I would have been able to carry the title. Again, there was a lot of pressure for the guy who had that belt. You were required to go all over the world and defend that title. If you don't know that, there, all the territories, you were required to go into, go into Mid-South, Bill Watts. Go up to Don Owens in Portland. Go, go over to St. Louis with Mushnick and the guys over there. Go down to Florida, championship wrestling, and defend it against their heavyweight champion. And I can tell you, Flair being one of the best of the best of the best, I, I say all that could work with a broomstick because he worked with me and make the broomstick look good because he made me look good. And he was the guy that could go in the ring with any guy, and he could tell you some stories of some of those heavyweight champions in those areas where that weren't that good, but he's able to go in there and, and make a match and make it look good. I don't know, honestly, I could have carried that, right? Whether it was 85 or even 86 Starcade and carried the title then. And for those of you who don't know, um, I walked away from wrestling uh, at one point. My wife, Mandy, at, at age 24, had, had been diagnosed with cancer. And at one point, I walked away in, in a main event role to take care of her. Now, I told him I'd be back, but I go, got to step away, guys. You know, I, I was, you know, one of the top guys, right? Sure. And I walked away to take care of her. She, she passed away at age 26. Uh, within a few weeks, I was at Flair's house in Charlotte's. Uh, sitting by his swimming pool when he offered me the belt once, and I, and I turned it down, the world heavyweight title. Uh, a few weeks later, invited me back down again, invited, and it, it offered it to me a second time, turned it down a second time. Uh, and so, I, again, kind of in a rare category, perhaps, of someone who's actually been offered the NWA world heavyweight title and turned it down not once, but twice. But no regrets that I never had it. And, and all that to say... At that point, in that earlier part of my career, don't know that I, 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 I could have lived up to the pressure uh, of carrying that belt, if that makes sense. Great question. Got time for a few, a few more. Thank you. Um, sort of to piggyback on last night when we were talking with Eddie Sharkey, I had asked him what type of uh, atmosphere that he had at his training facility. And you came up around a time that we had an incredible Right. What was it like working in Eddie Sharkey's training facility? Um, and I use the comparison to say, like, the Stu Hart dungeon. Okay. Great question. And so I get this all the time. And, and I have to bring correction every, every time. So the question was, what was it like to work in Eddie Sharkey's training center versus, like, Stu Hart or something of that nature? So catch what I said earlier in our conversation. I had no amateur background the night I debuted in Raleigh, North Carolina at the Dorton Arena, nor did I have any professional training. So I, I think I'm lumped into Eddie's group because he trained Henning, he trained Rude, he trained Animal, he trained Hawk, he trained Darso. He trained all these legends of wrestling. And I guess because I'm from Minnesota, everyone assumes, and from what I understand, I guess it's even out there on the internet, that Eddie Sharkey trained me. I had zero training, none. So I was not part of uh, Sharkey's. I, I went down a couple times when all those other guys were training just to watch them a couple times. I like, hey, hope you guys enjoy that career, you know, because I was a football guy, right? So for the record, 
I wasn't part of Eddie Sharkey's camp. Uh, so I just think it's funny because that question keeps coming up over and over and over again. So now you know the, the, the facts, the facts that, uh, that I wasn't part of Sharkey's camp, right? Um, I, I, he was a, obviously he, he, he trained the other guys well because of the careers they all had. But, uh, so that's the official stand and statement on that. So. I, so I said, you know, no, Adam and I did bounce for a short period of time in our college days uh, in Minneapolis, um, but I was not part of, I believe it was Grandma B's is the infamous bar that, and that Ole Anderson recruited some guys out of, Grandma B's, and so no, I was never a bouncer at Grandma B's either, so just for the record, so. Come on, I know, right? Hey, we got time, we got just a few minutes left, anyone in back or... or all right, the same guys keep asking questions, but that's okay. Come on. Whose idea was it for me to sickle David Crockett? Uh, that, that's a great question. I guess what we were trying to figure out is how could we, you know, part of the storyline was sign a contract against Ric Flair for the world heavyweight title, even though, uh, you know, I wasn't maybe number one contender or whatever. And so it might have been Jim Crockett, maybe, that came up with the idea uh, of being David and Rick had such a great relationship together, and they were good friends, well-known friends. They were in the plane crash together and all of that, okay, that uh, maybe that's a, that would tie into the storyline if I, if I sickled Crockett. And I uh, saw David recently, and, you know, I was invited to, to the weekend in Nashville, but I, I'd already had a commitment. I was doing a, a facilitating a men's conference in Virginia that Saturday and preaching that Sunday, and so I already had that commitment, so I couldn't go to Nashville. And I told David when he was interviewing me for that, I said, man, David, I, I, I heard they're, you know, building the old set, and you and Tony are going to be there. We could have recreated that one more time, David. And he wasn't all, like, real up with that. He's like... Yeah, I don't know about that. In fact, when Tony interviewed him, well, I guess on, the, on, on their podcast, he goes, Tony goes, I noticed you laid there for a while. He said, yeah, I just wanted to make sure everything was still working. All right, I've got sickle, one. right? We, just, we got the five-minute mark. <clears throat> I, I think you'll find this one interesting. <clears throat> no question, you, Joe, and Mike, Animal and Hawk, were friends. Well, I was friends with Animal Hawk, not so much. Oh, okay. That's a whole other thing. Keep going. With it. Keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll clarify but, that. But your matches, you, Uncle Ivan against the Road Warriors. Chain matches. Were, are this day talked about as probably the most brutal feud ever in wrestling. Physical, yes. So, and not to hurt anybody, yeah. but I mean just a physicality yes. of you, Animal, and Hawk. How hard is that when you're knowing, you know, like with Animal, a friend, and you basically <laughs> have to go in the ring and try and, I mean, P not portray hurt him, Portray but, this character. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, you'll see, for like, again, after did a magazine cover, right, with Ivan and I standing kind of, you know, squared off against the Road Warriors on the magazine. And then there were many times, and that was challenging uh, because we were such, I and mean, we were like brothers. Like when I recruited him out of college, I mean, we were the best of best of best. Of, I mean, I became like a prodigal child to the family. Of course, as some of you know, he had two other brothers, Mark and Johnny, who wrestled and went on to have, do other stuff. And, but, um, and, and so to stand nose to nose in the ring, and people are like, how did you not laugh, man? I mean, you guys are best of friends. But again, it was a mindset, right? You just project yourself into that role, and it was a mindset. And, and so for the record, let me just say this, too. When I say that Hawk and I weren't necessarily best of friends, I mean, we weren't enemies, but clearly anyone who knows Hawk's story, Hawk had a different lifestyle again, like Ivan. Hawk had a different lifestyle than Nikita Koloff. And so we, we worked well together in the ring as peers, but we didn't always see eye to eye outside of the ring. So we were not the best of friends. All that to say, I'd be remiss to not say this. Fast forward later on in life, similar to Ivan, I had invited Joe to a, a conference out in Phoenix, Arizona called AIM, Athletes International Ministries. It was for professional and college Christian athletes. And I'd heard Animal and his family had given their life to Christ, and I said, man, you need to come. He said, could Hawk come? And I paused, and I go, knowing Hawk's lifestyle, I said, Joe, 
you understand it's a Christian conference, right? I'm like, I don't know how that'll fly. He goes, I feel like I'm supposed to invite him. I said, all right, invite him. He called me back a couple hours later. He goes, he wants to come. I'm like, wow, God must really be up to something here. Fast forward, I get to Phoenix. First thing I do is go to Pastor Larry. I go, have you seen the road warriors? I was like, I, I didn't, wasn't sure they'd actually come. Well, they came. A man named Jensen Franklin was preaching that first night. Hawk was the first one come down to respond to the altar, gave his life to Christ. We baptized him in the pool. I brought him on the road with me for the next year and a half, discipling him, mentoring him, had some great stories. We were snowbound in, up in Washington, D.C. For, for three days, uh, and all we could do is just discuss the Bible and his, and his new walk with Christ. Yeah, you know, he, was, he wasn't perfect like none of us, and, and had the privilege of speaking at his funeral and sharing some of, of that story. He and I became better friends than Animal and I were during that year and a half. We became even better friends than Animal and I. So, little backstory there on, on, on Road Warrior Hawk. But, can all that to say, I know we're almost out of time here. We have just a few minutes left. Um, those matches were incredibly memorable, especially the chain matches, the double chain matches. Uh, again, if you're not, I mean, those chains were real. They were real chains, and you couldn't always control what those chain links were going to yeah. do. Especially when you start wrapping it around a guy's head or wrapping it around a guy's neck or wrapping it through a guy's mouth. The guy had cosmetic surgery on some of my teeth because those links would chip your teeth. And so, like, yeah, like, and, and no matter how well you tried to work them, wrapping it around your fist to punch a guy, I mean, those things would hit you in the eye. I mean, so, yeah, so they, they were pretty physical matches against, against the Road Warriors uh, for sure. And uh, I want to do this. I want to uh, at least with one more fan question, uh, save some of the rest of you for tonight at the banquet uh, with you. One, one more fan. Okay, in back, back. We'll do these last two right here. Favorite matches, the end of my career, 91 and 92. Uh, yes. So when I came back, so Mandy passes away, I finally make a decision a after a, a lengthy hiatus from, from pro wrestling to come back, Phoenix, Arizona. My dear, my, my dear friend, who now my dear friend Lex Luger, he and I do uh, camps and, and ministry, a lot of ministry together. We do this camp called Man Camp together uh, every spring and every fall. And uh, my introduction back was to, to present him with the brand new U.S. title. Uh, so I felt the best way to do that was to knock him upside the head with it, you know, there in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and create an angle. And so working with Lex again, having put the U.S. title on him in Greensboro in the cage, as some of you may remember, now kind of full circle and, and working that angle and eventually working Sting into that angle. So being able to work with, with Steve, being able to work with Lex, were probably two of the most memorable matches during 91 and 92. And then when Steve and I kind of, Sting and I kind of kissed and made up, uh, when I brought the, the little stinger out into the ring with me one night in Atlanta, who, by the way, was my oldest daughter, Taryn, uh, with her face painted up. I told her this. I said, when I ask you who your favorite wrestler is, please don't say daddy, okay? Now, <laughs> daddy is. My daddy is. I said, please say Sting is your favorite wrestler. Even kayfabing with even your own daughter. My own daughter, kayfabe, darling, say Sting. Even though I know I am, you know. But uh, Sting and Luger. So, okay, last question right here, and then i got to get off to a photo op. Traveling stories, traveling with other wrestlers. Rick Steiner was one of the biggest jokers in the, on the planet, uh, if you're not aware of that. Uh, what, one quick story would be, I, I remember the time that we were, we were driving down the interstate, and not that we would ever be speeding back then, but uh, Rick liked, liked playing bumper cars at high speed on the interstates. L like legit, like for real. And if you weren't paying attention in your rearview mirror when your car jerked and you look back and there's Rick Starner behind the wheel going, <laughs> and, 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 and you couldn't hit, you, you couldn't, you didn't want to hit the brakes because he had his foot on the gas pedal. 
and, and forcing you to go faster, 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 faster. And uh, so there's one quick story. Rick Steiner, the ultimate practical joker. So, hey, you guys have been amazing. Thank you guys for, for showing up. I'll be doing a photo op, singles, duel with Magnum, autograph signing, I think, from 1 to 3, and then the banquet tonight. God bless you guys, man. Thank you guys for coming. And Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken, as well. So. More dress at the banquet. We'll get a pick tonight, too. Yep. All right, yeah, we might ask you a few questions at the banquet tonight, too. So. God bless you guys.